Um, so today she will be speaking to us about human norovirus infection of enteroids requires uh, functional uh, buccal seal transferase too. So take it away, Victoria. Okay, thank you, Lynn, for the introduction. Uh, so I recently graduated from the Estes lab and I'm happy to uh, have the opportunity today to share with the greater TMC community some of my thesis work. Uh, I wanna start with a little bit of background on human noroviruses. The noroviruses were first discovered in 1968, where an elementary school in Norway had uh, an outbreak of astrophysical illness. 50% of students and teachers developed GI illness, uh, which as diagram shows is one of the area, and we don't want that. Material from the outbreak is used to create a two principal filtrate, and that's used to challenge volunteers for a living. In 1972, Alpine was able to use material from the outbreak to identify for the first time a virus as an etiological agent for transmissible gastric disease uh, by IEA. This was the first of the human viruses and is part of a family called the leaf virus. These viruses are in different shape and work on like structures that stand in the EM. Norovirus can cause both epidemic and so there'll be outbreaks in schools, aftercares, long-term care facilities, uh, with the original facilities before at home. Okay. Um, norovirus has been transmitted from one football team to a, another football team during a game. Um, it's associated with uh, foodborne illness outbreaks when contaminated health workers uh, will contaminate food. You can also get norovirus by uh, touching contaminated surfaces and then touching your mouth. Uh, so everyone, please remember to wash your hands. Worldwide annually, norovirus can cause over 200,000 deaths and will lead to over $60 billion in direct and indirect costs. Immunocompromised patients can uh, develop chronic norovirus infection, and unfortunately, there are no therapeutics. So I wanted to put that $60 billion number into some perspective because once numbers get that big, it's a little difficult to know how much that really is. Uh, I like sports, so I calculated out how much it would cost to buy the professional uh, baseball, football, hockey, and basketball teams in both Texas and Washington State. Uh, you can buy all of these teams twice over and still have a little bit of money left to spend. Uh, so this shows uh, how costly this uh, norovirus disease is um, on both a monetary and health uh, level. So why haven't we developed more therapeutics uh, for these important viruses? And that's because despite decades of attempts to cultivate the human noroviruses and establish laboratory cell lines, uh, none of these attempts were successful. And that indicates that there's a missing factor in these continuous cell lines that would permit for uh, norovirus infection. Along the way, we were able to uh, discover a few things though. Our lab showed that you could take the isolated norovirus genome, um, an RNA genome, from the stool and transfect this into continuous uh, laboratory cell lines. And this would produce new viral particles. However, those viral particles cannot infect their neighbors. And this shows us that the restriction for infection in continuous cell lines uh, is a uh, restriction at entry stages. We also know from a multitude of studies uh, that norovirus susceptibility is associated with histoblood group antigens or your secretor status, which I'll discuss in more detail later. Secretor positive individuals are more likely to be infected by norovirus than secretor negative individuals. We also know that uh, secretor HPGAs can be an initial binding factor for infection, but this is not enough to allow for infection in the classical cell line. So those expressing HPGAs like PACO2s or lines that have been modified to express HPGAs like a modified 293FT line do not become permissive. Together, these things uh, indicate that what's uh, missing during entry would either be a co-receptor or a glycoprotein receptor that isn't on these continuous cell lines. So what we need is needed was a new cell culture system that would overcome this restriction. 
norovirus affects the small intestinal epithelia, so it would be great to have an intestinal uh, cell culture system, which has been difficult to achieve. The intestine is complex. It's comprised of villi and crypt regions. The crypts contain stem cells, which will differentiate into the other cell types found in the small intestine. And these are interspersed with canid cells, which can secrete antimicrobial factors and proliferative factors. The villi contain differentiated cell types like goblet cells, enteroendocrine cells, and enterocytes. Recently, there was a key breakthrough in intestinal cell culture from the Sato and Cleavers group in the Netherlands. They showed that you could take biopsies or surgic surgical tissue from different segments of the small intestine, like the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Um, all the data today I'll show focuses on the jejunum, and isolate the crypts, which contain the stem cells. And given the right proliferation promoting growth factors, these will form 3D mini guts shown here. These cultures are non-transformed. Uh, they can be passaged indefinitely, so they can be frozen down and taken back out to culture like regular cell lines, uh, but they are multicellular, physiologically active. Uh, importantly, they retain the segment and patient specificity from which they were derived. Um, and we can also plate them as monolayers and differenti differentiate them, uh, getting a large population of enterocytes, and use these for norovirus infections. So for the first time in, in 50 years after that original outbreak, we were able to show that human intestinal enteroids could be infected by human norovirus, developing a cell culture system for this virus. And the virus generated in the system uh, is infectious. What was interesting is that most strains of human norovirus actually required the addition of an extra factor, bile, to uh, permit for infection shown that we had to further mimic the intestinal milieu to get infection. So the aims of my dissertation research were focused on entry factors. I wanted to delineate the mechanism of bile acid mediated infection, uh, which I won't speak about today, but was a big focus of my thesis. Um, and then I wanted to confirm the importance of the histoblood group antigens in human norovirus infection of HIE. And then hopefully use this information to determine the cellular receptor for human norovirus, uh, which we are still working on. Uh, before I continue, I want to go into a little more detail on blood type, uh, because I've been talking about infection of the intestinal epithelia. Histoblood blood group antigens are a glycan family that was originally identified from red blood cells, giving them their family name. Glycans are sugar chains that are formed with different enzymes, like the A or B that you've probably heard of in reference to your blood type. In red blood cells, uh, a fucosal transferase, but one, will add fucose, always depicted as a triangle, onto growing sugar chains. These chains can then be added onto lipids or proteins, and um, in certain cell types can be secreted. In cells found in the small intestine, a different fucosal transferase is active, but two, and this will also add on PCOS into growing chains, and these can be displayed on the cell surface and secreted outside the cell. We wanted to see if infection of HIEs would mirror our epidemiologic and challenge study data. Um, in challenge studies, volunteers are challenged with the virus, and we know things about them like their secretor status. So we were able to determine genetic susceptibility based on HPGA profile. Now in enteroids, uh, we've been able to test uh, enteroids derived from different secretor positive or secretor negative individuals. Here, I'm showing genome equivalence per well, and uh, we always do our infections in duplicate. So we take a plate at one hour infection to harvest. This shows us our baseline uh, virus that found, uh, and then we take a plate later, uh, in this case, at six days post-infection to determine how much replication we had. That's shown in the gray bar here. Two predominant strains, G24 and G23, were able to infect our secretor positive J2 cell line, enteroid line. We tested multiple secretor negative lines, and we found that G24 was not able to infect any of these secretor negative lines, uh, but G23 was able to infect a subset. It could infect J4 and J8. This shows, again, what we knew before from epidemiological data, the G24 uh, could only infect the secretor positive, but not secretor negative enteroids, 
and that G23 was capable of infecting both secretor positive and some secretor negative lines. Part of my project focused on identifying other factors required for G23 infection. I told you before that this virus was one of, was a virus that required bile for infection. We went on to determine that individual bile acids are sufficient for replication and worked with a specific bile acid, GCDCA. Here I'm showing robust G2 free infection in the presence of 500 micromolar GCDCA. Other strains like G217 and G11 also require GCDCA for infection. We determined that the effect of GCDCA was on the cell. GCDCA induces rapid apical ceramide accumulation, uh, shown here in red after 10 minutes of GCDCA treatment. And in the orthogonal view, you can see that ceramide will actually cluster into uh, ceramide-rich lipograph regions. Adding ceramide alone was sufficient for modest replication. We also showed that GCDCA can induce uptake using a dye that's fluorescent only when intercalated in membranes. So if allowed to bind, and then any unwashed dye is, uh, any unbound dye is washed away, what will be labeled as newly taken up compartments. And we found that within 10 minutes, there was a rapid increase in, G in stained compartments showing that GCDCA influences uptake. So from there, we had a model uh, where we would get ceramide-enriched lipid raft regions on the cell surface. And my hypothesis is that the receptor and HPGAs are able to interact with the virus there um, and combine with the uptake activity of GCDCA, the virus is able to enter and infect cells. The final point I want to make here is that in the subsequent infections that I'm showing, uh, GCDCA will be present in all infection experiments, including um, in G23 infections, G24 infections, which don't require bile, but is enhanced by bile acid. So in our HIEs, we wanted to ask if using isogenic HIE lines with the same uh, genetic background, aside from the manipulation of foot two, would these be permissive to infection? A former postdoc in our lab, uh, Kay Haga, generated these isogenic lines. He took our parental J4, which is secretor negative, or foot two negative, and non-permissive to G24 infection, and made it secretor positive by the addition of uh, CMV-driven constitutively expressed foot two. He also took our secretor positive parental line, J2, which is G24 permissive, and knocked out foot two using CRISPR-Cas9. First, we just looked to see if this altered the expression of the HPGAs in our enteroid lines. We used UEA1 lectin, which will recognize the alpha-1-2 fucose that uh, foot two adds, um, and it uh, can be tagged to a fluorescent molecule. Here in red, you can see in our secretor positive parental line, J2, that there's apical staining uh, by UEA1, showing that HBGAs are at our cell surface. When we knocked out foot two and the line became secretor negative, we lost the apical HBGA staining. But what was interesting is we now had this internal uh, HBGA staining, which was unexpected because we had knocked out foot two. We saw a similar pattern with our secretor negative uh, parental line. This line originally had this internal UEA1 staining uh, showing HBGAs were uh, inside the cell. And then when we knocked in foot two, we now return to having uh, this phenotype with apical UEA1 staining and uh, no internal staining. We then took these lines and infected them with norovirus to test their permissivity. Here I'm showing the data from our J4 foot two uh, negative line where we knocked in foot two. In the case of both G24 and G23, neither was infecting these lines in the presence of bile acid, but when we added back in foot two, these lines now became permissive to norovirus infection. I'm not showing the data, but G11 and G217, two additional strains of norovirus, behaved similarly. They were uh, not able to infect the J4, but could infect the J4 with uh, foot two added in. We also tested our knockout line, and we found that G24 infection was lost in the knockout. Uh, when we lose foot two, this line is no longer permissive to infection. It, could, uh, it was not able to be infected by G217 or G11 as well. 
And what was interesting is that G23 was still able to infect this secretor negative line, which is in line with the epidemiologic data we've seen before. Uh, what you might have noticed is in the first uh, figure that I showed where we were just testing bile at six days post-infection, the J4 foot line, foot two line, uh, negative line was infected by G23, um, but it wasn't infected by G23 in the presence of just bile acid. So we went back and tested this again, uh, now out to six days post-infection instead of just 24. Um, here I'm showing the J2 parental, which is secretor positive, the J2 uh, secretor negative line, where foot two was knocked out, and the J4 uh, parental line, which is secretor negative. We only get infection with GCDCA in the J2 uh, foot two knockout, but not the uh, J4 foot two um, secretor negative line. Together, this shows us that there are additional genetic factors and potentially other components in bile that might influence which secretor negative lines that G23 can replicate in. The conclusions of these studies are that the presence of FUT2 is necessary for secretion of HPGAs to the cell surface, that FUT2 is both necessary and sufficient for G24, G217, and G11 infection of enteroids, that the receptor for human norovirus is present in secretor negative lines, but we needed proper fecosylation, so knock in a foot two to get infection. And that the G23 can replicate in some, but not all, secretor negative lines, indicating there are other genetic factors playing a role in susceptibility. This is a piece of evidence indicating that there are strain specific differences, including the requirement for bile differing among strains, and as Roy will speak about in the next talk sensitivity to the innate response. For our future directions, we want to further investigate the importance of other fecosal transferases found in our lines um, and interest in determining what's going on with this internal stain, as well as, uh, as a factor important for infection of non-secretor lines. Foot two is also able to do alpha one two linkage similar to foot one, or to Foot one and foot two are both able to do alpha one two linkage. Uh, traditionally, foot two is thought to be the secretor, uh, the fecosal transferase expressed in the intestine, but we know from RNA seq data that foot one is expressed a bit at lower levels in our enteroids. So we look to see if uh, this uh, UEA one staining that we saw before inside was in fact specific to uh, fucose detection and not some non-specific activity of UEA1. To do this, we pre-incubated UEA1 with fucose at uh, increasing concentrations. With 10 millimolar fucose uh, pre-incubation, we lost the internal staining completely, as well as most of the apical staining, showing that this is a specific uh, interaction of UEA1 with alpha-1,2 fucose. All of the staining on the cell surface was lost uh, with a higher concentration of fucose. So in the future, uh, we'll investigate the importance of foot one by creating additional knockout lines uh, to be able to study this in an isogenic background. Foot three, another fecosal transferase, which has also been linked to uh, ability of uh, some noroviruses to bind um, and infect individuals. Um, it's known as the, the Lewis blood group antigen, is another fecosal transferase that we want to investigate through knockout studies. Second, uh, for our future directions, we'd like to learn what we've used so far to isolate and identify the receptor for human norovirus found in HIVs. So based on my studies on the importance of bile acid in G2 free infection, I hypothesized that a receptor would be found in lipid rafts on the cell surface um, and that it uh, may be interacting with the HBGA or the receptor itself is glycosylated. So we've collaborated with experts in glycoproteomics and glycolipidomics in Sweden, uh, the Larsen Group at University of Gothenburg, and we've used many of our different HIE lines, as well as our isogenic HIE lines, to do glycolipidomic and glycoproteomic profiling, profiling of the enteroids. The glycolipidomics study was recently published, and we're working on the glycoproteomics data now. We hope from this that we can determine a number of receptor candidates for testing 
with a final goal of using our receptor candidates to generate a cell line permissive to norovirus infection that's easy to use. Enteroids have allowed us to make several key discoveries on noroviruses. However, the cost and technical challenges of the system can be limiting for its use in standard clinical or food microbiology labs. So we hope to use uh, the information about lipid rafts, as well as uh, the glycolipidomic and glycoproteomic profiling to identify the viral entry receptor, and then modify a simple continuous cell line to create an easy to use system with the receptor, HBGAs, and the addition of bile acid. And this can be used for future studies uh, by any norovirus virology laboratory. With that, I'd like to thank everyone in the Estes and Atmar labs, especially my mentors, Dr. Estes and Dr. Atmar, um, everyone on the norovirus cultivation team, um, especially uh, Khalil, Amesh, and Roy, who helped a lot with my project, Enteroid Core, for providing all of the Enteroids. Uh, our collaborators, uh, former postdoc in the lab, Kay Haga, who created I these isogenic lines and spoken about today, as well as the Larson Group for their expertise in glycomics. With that, um, thank you. Uh, and I, I want to do one little promotion for our lab. If you're looking to rotate in a virology lab on a norovirus project, you can find us on Baylor's website or on Twitter at atestislab underscore BCM. And I can take questions. All right, thank you, Victoria, for the wonderful talk. Um, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to, uh, to just uh, mute yourself and then you can ask directly or type in the chat too. Uh, I, I guess I have uh, one question. Um, so, if well, do you think if uh, foot one and foot three they're knocked out, and will you see like um, the same effect as if you knocked out foot two? Um, right. So, what would be what the is, predicted outcome? What would be most interesting is looking at the effect on G two three infection. So yeah. that was the virus that was able to infect some of the secretor negatives. So it would be interesting to see if without both foot two and foot three, if G23 could still infect those lines, or if knocking out foot one, which might be causing that internal staining, uh, maybe has something to do with the entry, um, mm. early entry stages of G23. Um, so I think in that context, we, we could see some differences. Um, okay. In the context of G24, it may not be different because already not infected. Those I see. Oh. Right, so if uh, no one has more questions, I'll move on to the second speaker. All right. All right, so for our second uh, Second talk for, for today, uh, we have um, Roy Lin. Um, and Roy is a graduate student in Dr. Mary Assis's lab at Baylor College of Medicine. And he received his bachelor and master's degree in National Taiwan University before joining Baylor. And his research interests focus on viral host interactions and immune responses against human norovirus infections. Um, today, he will be speaking to us about human norovirus exhibits strain-specific sensitivity to host interferon pathways in human intestinal enteroids. All right, so whenever you're ready, Roy. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction. And uh, can everyone hear me clearly? I think yes. it's good. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. So, so today, I would like to talk about how we use human intestinal enteroid to study the host inner immune response, especially the interferon pathway induced by human norovirus infection. And as she introduced, I'm Roy in the, I, I hope I can graduate soon in Dr. Estes' lab. <laughs> so firstly, 
Uh, thanks for Victoria's introduction. I will recap some important details for human norovirus because some people may join laterly. So human norovirus is a serious disease, inclu uh, will include vomiting and diarrhea, just like this poor pumpkin after the pumpkin carving event each year. The worst thing is that you only need to inject fewer than 100 human norovirus particles to get those symptoms, and you can last for several days. You need to stay on the toilet on the, for several days or during the midnight. It very, it's very painful. <clears throat> so each year, it causes million cases of infection, including hundreds of deaths. And uh, it's highly contagious, and uh, the virus can even last outside human bodies for seven days, which means some people touch the doorknob or on the table and contain some norovirus particle on that. And during these seven days, if a second people touch those surface and inject uh, and contaminate the food, the food will cause you to have the similar symptom as human norovirus infection. So which means it's highly contagious and, uh, and stable even outside human body. And there is no good therapeutic strategy, including antiviral drug or vaccines for us to deal with the disease. So you will see some news that it caused pandemic uh, original outbreak each year. And the, re the reason why we cannot deal the human norovirus uh, pandemic very well is because since the virus was discovered in 1968, there was no good in vitro culture method for us to study the pathogenesis of human norovirus clearly. People only use surrogate model, for example, uh, mouse no mouse norovirus or other uh, in vitro in vitro or other RNA norovirus RNA trans transfusion system to study in different approach to study human norovirus pathogenesis. But this is an uh, indirect model and a uh, Although they have very good publication, but it's still not fully recapitulate human norovirus itself. But in our lab, we make a good breakthrough, as Victoria introduced before. We, in 2016, we successfully used human intestinal entry to study uh, to culture human norovirus in vitro. To obtain the entry, you need to isolate the intestinal crib from patient biopsy. The stem cell inside the crib will be propagate and differentiate into multilobular intestinal-like structure. We call it entry or mini gut. At first, it will look like 3D structure, and this 3D, 3D entry can be propagate or freeze down into liquid nitrogen and keep for many, many times. So we call, we call it uh, entry stock, or our lab has uh, entry banks from different patients. So you, every time you need to use more entry, you, need to, you don't need to isolate from intestinal creep, always. And the 3D entry can be further played into the culturing plate into the monolayer form. And after differentiate, our lab report that it are, they are susceptible to human norovirus infection. Entry has several advantages. First, it's non-transformed cell culture, which is better than, better than the immortalized cancer cell line people use, for example, CACO2 cell or 293 T cell to study normal cell functions. And also, as Victoria showed, the uh, slide before, it contains different cell types, including enterocyte, enteroendocrine cells, goblet cell, and penna cells, which are all important to recompose into the whole human intestinal tissue. And third, we, we rec reca recapture host or segment surface fitity. What's that mean? The host means that the entry has the same genetic code as the, the donor, donor patient. So if the donor patient has some rare genetic defect, the entry will have the same phenotype. So you can study the entry in vitro. And if the entry is isolated from jejunal, duodenal, or ileum, it will recapture the segment specificity as well. So that's very important characteristics. And lastly, but most importantly, it's susceptible to human norovirus infection. And so far, it's the only and best model, in vitro model for us to use. And since our lab has this powerful system, we, started to, we start to investigate everything about human norovirus infection. For me, I personally interest in the innate immune response, especially the interferon pathway, whether they are critical for human norovirus infection or not. Right now, I just want to briefly talk about the general, general pathway of, of uh, inter, uh, interferon pathway in our body. So when a virus infects itself, 
The bioRNA or DNA can be recognized by host pattern recognition receptors, including toll-like receptor or regular-like receptor or others. It will trigger the downstream pathway to turn on interferon gene expression. And the secreting interferon from infected cells serve as an alarming signal to warn the neighboring cell that there's a virus, virus infection event, so the neighboring cell will induce their interferon receptor downstream pathway to turn on their jack dead and uh, start to express interferon stimulating gene we call ISG. And the neighboring cell will turn into antiviral state to be more resistant to viral infection or have some way to reduce uh, viral, viral RNA or, or viral gene expression when it enter antiviral state. So for interferon, we can regard it as the first and more critical, the most critical innate immune response when the when our body infected by virus or other pathogen. So people already found uh, classify three different types of interferon: type one, type two, and type three. Type one interferon, also called interferon alpha and beta, it is produced by all nuclear, all all different type of cells if once they are infected by virus. And type 2 interferon, also called interferon gamma, which is mainly produced by immune cells. And we didn't have that in our entry system, so I will skip this part. And the type 3 interferon I want to emphasize today is that we also call, call interferon lambda. It's a newly discovered interferon. And uh, unlike type 1 interferon, it's ubiquitous express. Type 3 interferon has been found to be more dominant in the mucosal layer, including the respiratory Retory, GI tract, or reproductive tract. And since it's very restricted expression pattern, so we start to think about whether type 3 interferon is maybe more important for gastrointestinal tract disease, for example, human norovirus infection. So today, in my big, my, the big picture of my study is that I want to study whether uh, interferon response play an important role during human norovirus infection. To do so, we start to use the most prevalent strain, G24 human norovirus, to, to infect human intestinal entry and to measure whether the interferon response is induced or not. And if we really detect interferon response, right now we want to see how it shaped the human norovirus replication inside the entry. So we can artificially activate the interferon pathway by adding in such as in interferon to see how the viral repl replication look like or we can inhibit the interferon pathway by knocking out some critical gene in the pathway, for example, the interferon receptor or downstream step one transcription factors. There are two ways we want to discuss. I, I, I will show you today whether you can alter human norovirus replication. So first, we do a time course infection in, of G24 human norovirus in entry. You can see Mark group is the uninfected group as a control, and the poly-IC is another it's, a, it's our positive control to, to induce interferon pathway because poly-IC is the top TLR3 agonist to turn on interferon pathway ubiquitously. And uh, when and we have G24 human norovirus infection wells and G24 human norovirus are neutralized with antiserin to stop the infection. And you can see that G24 human norovirus start to replicate at 12 hour and 24 hour detect by real time PCR about its G24 human norovirus RNA content. And when the virus start to replicate, we, we also monitor type one or type two interferon here. You can see that the type one interferon, transcript interferon alpha one didn't induce as the virus replicate. And also only minorly induced even upon poly IC treatment. But however, you can see type three interferon start to express a lot about three log difference Three, three to four log difference when the virus start to replicate. And it also is highly induced in poly-IC treated group. And when we block the infection by the neutralizing antiserin, you can see that no, no replication and no in type two interferon induction. And the induced type two interferon pathway further trigger the downstream ISG interferon stimulating gene expression IF544L, which can be detailed at detect at later time point. So in this data, we can clearly show that type 2 interferon, interferon lambda is induced upon human norovirus replication, followed by IG expression. 
And uh, for the entry, since it derived from it's derived from GI tract, it's more predominantly expressed type two interferon rather than type one interferon here. So right now we already know that uh, human norovirus can induce interferon response. So I want to see whether if we boost the interferon response, whether we can antagonize human norovirus replication or not. So to do so, I treat the I pre-treat the entry with interferon recombinant interferon, which are commercialized, available, and uh, or poly-IC to turn on the interferon pathway by turn on the toli receptor three, uh, toli, toli receptor and um, the downstream interferon pathway to make the, to enforce the cell to make their own interferon to turn on their IG. And you can see first, if we pre-treat the entry monolayer with interferon for 24 hours before infection, you can see if we compare, compare with non-treatment group, both type one and type two interferon can significantly reduce human norovirus replication a lot. And uh, if we pre-treat the cell with poly-IC at different time before infection, you can see that if we use poly-IC to make the cell in, into antiviral state by boosting their endogenous interferon pathway, they are still have some reducing effect to human norovirus replication. But if you add poly IC after infection, the effect only the effect the effect the effect is much less than pretreatment group. So in this case, we can conclude that human norovirus induced type two interferon response in entry, and the exogenous activation of interferon pathway by, for example, interferon pretreatment or poly IC pretreatment can reduce human norovirus replication to a certain degree. And this finding, uh, this finding make us start to think about whether we can use type 3 interferon as a therapeutic strategy against human norovirus chronic infection, in especially immunocompromised cancer patients. Because unlike type 1 interferon, which is systemic expressed, type 2 interferon, if you uh, treat with patients, they only work on their GI tract or respiratory tract and uh, or reproductive tract, and which has, min has minor side effect and the uh, systemic boost of the certain interferon response by type one interferon. So we, we, can we can regard type three interferon may be a good therapeutic strategy to treat patient when the patient itself blows the innate or adaptive immunity to clear the virus on their self. And for the next part, I want to switch gear to another angle. So if we attenuate interferon response by, for example, inhibitor or CRISPR-Cas9, whether, whether we can boost human norovirus replication. To do so, we first try to use the inhibitor study. The chemical inhibitor Y136, which is, has been commercialized and uh, is a solid receptor expressed by Yabalai disease virus. It's a protein that can neutralize type one and type three interferon protein in your media. So if you add into the median, it will bind to the type one or type two interferon protein. So the interferon protein can no longer bind to their receptor in neighboring cell to turn on the downstream interferon signaling. And in this case, I start to try different, two different types of uh, human norovirus. The first is G24 predominant strain, and the, the second one is G23 non predominant strain. And Victoria already showed that it's bioassay dependent. And uh, we will talk more about G23 later. And, and you can see that if we, if I add the type if I add the Y one thirty six after infection, you can see it strongly reduced the IHG expression, which means the secreting interferon has been successfully neutralized to a certain degree. So it no longer induced the same level of IHG as the control group. But however, we didn't see any change in both G two four and G two three expression level compared with the untreated group and the uh, Y136 treaty group. So this is a uh, weird finding. So I start to want to, I want to use other way to prove the phenotype is true or not. So to, to do so, we start to think about use CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out the interferon pathway gene to shut down the interferon pathway genetically. I first try to use the well-known lengthy CRISPR V2 system discussed by the Dr. John, Dr. John Lab in MIT. And in this system, it's a bicytronic system. You can clone your small guiding RNA here, and uh, it can also express Cas9 in the same in the same in the same plasma, but by two different promoter. Oh, by the way, I maybe people already know that, but I just want to introduce CRISPR-Cas9 system. It's a 
it's a very convenient uh, uh, genome, genome editing tool that is a uh, RNA guided uh, double strand. It's a RNA guided double strand nucleus that can that can bind to your target site DNA and cause double strand break uh, based on your guiding RNA sequence. So when a when a the host gene got double strand break, it will it will generate it will in my when when the host cell try to repair the DNA double strand break in your target site, it's likely to generate a friendship mutation or or a stop codon mutation after the repair. So it may it's it's a, it's a way to knock out your gene. So in this case, we try to knock out the interferon pathway genes. For example, the interferon alpha receptor one or lambda receptor one. When we knock out that, we can shut down the type one and type two interferon pathway. In this case, we first try. We first I first generate the wild uh, type one interferon receptor knockout or type two interferon receptor knockout entry, and verify by sequencing and functional assay and in fact by G two four human norovirus at first to see the viral replication kinetic. As you can see, if we knock out type two interferon pathway, the IG induced is it is highly reduced compared with knocking out type one interferon pathway in G two four infection. But however, even we successfully block the type one or type two interferon pathway by genetic knockout, we didn't see a difference of G two four human norovirus replication compared with the wild type block lines. And Another, I start to try another approach. If I try to knock out the step one transcription factor, which is important for type one or type two interferon signaling pathway, because step one is shared by type one and type two interferon pathway as a downstream transcription, transcription factor. Or I try to knock out MAPS, which is an important downstream mediator of toli receptor pathway. By knocking out these two, I can successfully block a certain degree of IG expression or the host interferon pathway. If I knock out that one, almost no, almost we only detect very low IG expression here. But however, knocking out that one or maps didn't didn't change anything or boost the G two four human norovirus replication. So I successfully generate the knock the knockout, but we didn't see the phenotype we want. That's a very interesting re interesting finding. And we start to think about whether it's G two four specific event or not. So I tried another another trend, G two three human norovirus, as Victoria presented before. You can see that unlike G two four, we see strong strength specific sensitivity to host inter endogenous interferon response. When G two three, when we use G two three to infect, for example, type one interferon receptor knockout, type two interferon receptor knockout entry or step one or mass knockout entry, we see it replicate better in type one interferon receptor knockout entry as the blue lines. And also the replication is improved in step one knockout entry. So unlike G24 has no change, G23 really, G23 infection is really sensitive to the host endogenous interferon response. So when we use CRISPR to knock out the endogenous response, we can successfully enhance the G23 replication. So I further want to confirm the real-time PCR data. So we use other way to prove that G23 really, the knocking out, the knockout entry really facilitate G2, G23 not only replication, but also spreading. We use that one knockout entry to do the FFA uh, for fluorescent focusing assay, or just you just image as an immunostaining to see viral antigen spreading during at the time of infection. You can see that the green Green color stands for human norovirus infected cell. In wild type, we only see a certain amount of cells, but in step one knockout, we can see more, more cell lights up with green color, and it, it's clustered together, which means that the virus may be successfully spreading from first infected cell and have multiple rounds of infection in the step one knockout entry if it's infected by G23. We, we also did G24, we didn't see the similar phenotype compared to wild type and the compare between wild time and state one knockout. If I quantify the number of the percentage of infected cell in the field, we see strongly induced uh, in, improve in state one knockout entry. And if I quantify, if I measure the pontus size, we also see an increase in state one knockout entry here. 
And further, we also did the TCID 50, which means that we want to determine the lowest, the lowest uh, infection dose of G23 human or virus when we, when we inoculate with different uh, genome, equivalent, genome equivalent per well. And you can see that compared with Walter and Troy, G23 human norovirus, if we, we can in, in, inoculate less virus, that's still replicate instead one Nago and Troy, but not then Walter and Troy. For Walter and Troy, you only need to, you need to inoculate more virus to infect a, a well. And uh, for Nago and Troy, you, only, you can in, inoculate maybe 10 times less than the Walter, uh, 10 times less to have the same infection event occur than the wild type entry. So this is around our second conclusion. So lastly, I want to see whether human norovirus, if we block the interferon pathway, we can improve the norovirus replication. But the result indicate that it's case by case, and we have shown the strength specific sensitivity to host interferon pathway. So we try to inhibit the interferon pathway but it only has G23 human norovirus infection, but G24 human norovirus replication remain unchanged even in knockout, knockout entry. So we start to think about whether there's other restricting factor for G24. So we may knock out the wrong antiviral pathway because the host, the, inter, the interferon pathway is only the one a part of the host in the immune response against, against viral infection. So if we can Target on other antiviral pathway. Maybe we can find another working pathway that G24 is sensitive to. Or, or another case is that G24 may have a way to escape the interferon response already. So it has no change. So it has no change if we if we use G24 to infect wild type cell and a, a step one nagal and Nagao or other Nagao cell because the G24 already shut down the interferon response to a certain degree that it can replicate at the same level. So to do so, we start to think, think whether we can compare we can compare G24 and G23 non-structured protein to see whether they, can, they have some difference to antagonize host interferon pathway or try to see try to see whether G24 and G23 have different infection route in intracellularly. Maybe G24 has, has, has some way to escape from the interferon response because it repl replicates in different intracellular compartments than G23. So that's some idea we are still cultivating and we will have that for our future work. So for today, I want to show you the takeoff message is that G23, G23 human norovirus is sensitive to stellar media host interferon pathway. So this is the, just the cartoon figure I draw. So in wild type entry, we only have a few viral infection occur, but if you knock out the host interferon pathway, for example, step one, you can see tons of virus infect in the, in the same model, in the entry model layer. So the significance of this finding is that uh, by studying the inner immune response, we find maybe type 2 interferon as a good therapeutic strategy to treat human norovirus infection or human norovirus chronic infection cancer uh, immunocompromised patient. And uh, if we really found a strategy, we can reduce the cost of treating human norovirus outbreak or chronic infection. That may be very meaningful that Victoria said we can save the money to buy more uh, American football teams. And also we can improve the entry model if we use the NAGO entry to study and uh, cultivate more human norovirus. Uh, cultivate more human norovirus by understanding the mechanism of infection. If we really can find a better in vitro model or we can increase the virus yield in entry system, that's another very important breakthrough. So lastly, I want to thank uh, my lab my mentors, Dr. Mary Kay Estes and Dr. Robert Ottima, to give me a lot of advice to pursue my PhD degree. And the, all the Estes lab work, people working here to give me a lot of feedback and uh, help me to do a lot of experiment. And my committee and uh, the better, better reagent resource and uh, the bioinformatic analysis, analysis and the IMBS program and my founding source. And by the way, the data I present today has been published uh, last month in the 
in the PNS. So if you're really interested in further, further research data, you can download a paper and uh, we can talk later. And that's all I have today. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you for your listening. Uh, stop share. Thank you, Roy, for the exciting talk. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, again, feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask, ask directly or put them in the chat. Oh, okay. So, um, question from Matthew. Just a general question. Have you noticed an upregulation of uh, interferon beta in these lines? And also, have you checked NF kappa B signaling? And uh, uh, for the type 1 interferon uh, pathway, we have used the RNA seq. In, in our paper, we have used RNA seq to validate that it's not induced to a significant level compared with type 2 interferon response. So, interferon beta is Slightly upregulated, but it's not reached a significant level. So we start to see, so we still conclude type 2 interferon is dominant. And for NF kappa B pathway, I need to check my, uh, I, need, I need to check my data, but I think the interferon pathway, the downstream factor, one downstream gene of interferon receptor may be in NF kappa B as well. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? Uh, if not, uh, thank you, Roy um, and Victoria for the wonderful talks. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, the next micro talks will be the last Wednesday of November. If it doesn't overlap with Thanksgiving, but um, we will be sending out um, emails on the next micro talk. So stay tuned and thank you. And thank bye. you for the invitation and the join. Okay, bye.